So tonight we're going to go to one place. That's a change for us. We usually do a regionals thing, but we're going one place, and it's called the Bridge of the Gods. Now there's a name. Isn't that a cool sounding name? You've heard of the Bridge of the Gods. Where is this thing? And the answer is the Columbia River Gorge. And you're like, well, okay, but I'm not quite sure where, where the Columbia River Gorge is. Well, let me help you out. Uh, this is a map of the Pacific Northwest, Idaho and Oregon and Washington. And here comes the Columbia River out of the Canadian Rockies. Here comes the Columbia River crossing the border, flowing through the deserts of eastern Washington. Here's the Columbia River hanging a right and audaciously heads straight for our biggest mountain range and goes right through it. The Columbia River cuts right through the middle of the Cascade Range, going from British Columbia down to Northern California. Now, why, how is that possible? How can you take a river and have it go right through a big mountain range? Put that one on hold. We're going to deal with that in just a bit. But the river continues past uh, the, the mountains. It gets to Portland, Oregon, another 100 miles, and it's to the Pacific Ocean. OK, so where is the Columbia River Gorge? It's just this spot right in here where it's a narrow gorge where the Columbia River is coming right through the middle of the Cascades. Happen to have a detailed map for you. It's almost like I planned this. I didn't plan the chalkboard, though, getting slammed. So this is a more detailed map of the Columbia River Gorge. And for those that know this place, We've got Oregon on one side, we've got Washington on the other. This is the Columbia River coming through the heart of the gorge. Here are the mountains both to the north and to the south. There are towns on the south side, the Oregon side, Hood River, Cascade Locks, Portland, north side, Washington side, towns of White Salmon and Stevenson. Okay, so that's where we're going to be tonight. And the topic is Bridge of the Gods. So is this a bridge? Is this like a bridge bridge? Like I can drive across the Bridge of the Gods? Yes, you can. There is a bridge. A bridge right here. Built in 1926. They obviously chose well. This is a place where the Columbia River has choked down to just 300 yards from Washington to Oregon. So it's a good place to build a bridge. The bridge is still there. You can drive across. You can go down tonight if you want. Drive across the Bridge of the Gods Bridge. It's a toll bridge. It costs you a buck to cross. Back and forth as many times as you want. If you've got a pocket full of quarters, just go nuts down there. Okay? Bridge of the Gods. Cantilever Bridge. I have no idea what that means. So this is a geology lecture. I'm not going to talk about that bridge. So there's something else called the Bridge of the Gods. Yes, there's a bridge you can drive across, but that's not our topic tonight. Our topic tonight is something called a geologic bridge of the gods. Okay, well, um, I'm not even sure what that means, a geologic bridge of the gods, you say. Where is it? Well, same place. All right, so I'm listening, you say. Well, I guess one way to picture a geologic bridge of the gods is to imagine some sort of bridge, like an actual like rock bridge, like some sort of arch, like... like uh, Arches National Park in southern Utah, right? Here's... Here's, uh, we're looking down the Columbia River Gorge, by the way. Well, Oregon's on our left and Washington's on our right. The sun is setting, so you're looking west, okay? You're driving to Portland from here, essentially. Have you ever noticed, by the way, that the gorge is asymmetric, that the Washington side is a lower gradient than the Oregon side? It's steep on the Oregon side? Okay, so are we really kind of picturing this for the Bridge of the Gods, some sort of rock arch with the Columbia River going underneath? No, we're not. That never existed. That's fantasy land. And you say, well, I think, no, hold up now. I think I saw like a painting or something where they had a, an actual rock bridge over the Columbia. And yes, you did. There are paintings like that. But let me get those out of our head. Those, th that's not accurate. That never happened. And you're like, well, how do you know it never happened? Well, we do this in science, right? We look for field evidence to reconstruct something that happened long ago, and there's no evidence for a rock arch or a rock bridge crossing the Columbia River. So, what is the Bridge of the Gods if it's not this actual bridge? And by the way, wasn't there like a, a Native American legend where there was a time when you could cross from Oregon into Washington uh, sometime in the past without getting your feet wet? 
yes, there is an oral tradition of that. And yes, that is true. There was a time you could cross the Columbia without getting your feet wet. Well, if it's not this rock arch then, so what are we talking about? It was a landslide. The Bridge of the Gods was a landslide. And it's no longer there. Meaning, there was a huge landslide, the Bridge of the Gods landslide, also known as the Bonneville landslide, and it was a huge portion of Washington that broke free at some point in the past, catastrophically slid down into the valley bottom, completely filled the gorge up to 300 feet of loose rubble, and dammed the river. That was the land bridge quote unquote, that Native Americans were crossing. There was this time when this bridge, this land bridge, this geologic bridge of the gods, completely sealed off the valley. And so we had not only the land bridge, but we had a lake, a lake of the gods that went 170 miles up to Tri-Cities. When we dam the river, we have a lake upstream of that landslide dam. So that's our topic. And you can see in my little map here, I've laid out five questions. So we've already, not, if, you're, if you're a checklist person, keeping track, you got your pencil out. So we know where we're talking now. And we just decided that this thing is a landslide and not a rock arch. But there are important questions. How is it possible to have, how is it possible to have landslides in the Columbia River Gorge? Is this the only one? No, there have been hundreds. There have been hundreds of landslides, mostly on the Washington side, sliding down. And then once we get that out of the way, these are the two juicy questions. Can we say something about when this landslide happened and what have geologists done recently to figure that out? Do we know the answer? And an even more tantalizing question, what triggered this thing? That's a big landslide. Blocking the Columbia River? Come on now. So why did it happen? There's a conventional answer. There's an unconventional answer. We're going to explore both. OK, so here's the answer for the how this is possible. The bedrock layers that happen to be running through the Columbia River Gorge area, as you can see in this cartoon, are not flat. They're tilted. They're tilted to the south. And the bedrock layers are not tilted to the south all through the Pacific Northwest, but in this particular part of the gorge, in this part of the map, the bedrock layers are tipping to the south, tilting to the south. And that's important because if you're on the Oregon side, what do we have that we can take pictures of? Waterfalls. Have you ever noticed that in the Columbia River Gorge, the waterfalls are all on the Oregon side? They're not on our side. That's because of the dipping beds, and it's a steep slope because we've got the beds dipping away. But those same beds can be found on, in other words, the bedrock layers, that's what I'm calling beds, can be found on the Washington side. And these are basalt lava flows coming from eastern Washington. That's a lecture that we've already done. These are not lavas from the Cascades. That may be a, a piece of news. You're going right through the Cascade Mountains. The Cascades are famous for volcanic eruptions, and yet the lavas that you're seeing in the walls of the Columbia River Gorge have nothing to do with the Cascades. They're lavas that came out of cracks over here in eastern Washington and flowed through the gorge just like the river does. OK. But the main idea is these landslides keep happening because we have these it's like a, a deck of cards that's all tilted and ready to go. And we're sliding these cards, essentially. And to make matters worse, we have sedimentary interbeds between these basalt lava rocks. And those beds get real wet. Some of them are clays. Clays are notorious for being slippery. So we've got a recipe for repeated landslides. And the Bridge of the Gods landslide is just one of many of these events. It's a topic tonight because it was relatively recent and impacted many things that we're going to talk about. OK, that's the how. Oh my god, we're really making progress. Well, I got a lot to say about these last two. So we're going to kind of slow down in our progress, but hopefully really dig in now and try to answer the when and the how. Excuse me, the when and the why. OK, so there we go. 
I think we should talk about this landslide and make sure that we realize that that thing actually happened. I think I want to do that first, and then I'm going to do some more drawing. So how are we sure that this landslide really did happen? Well, we've had landslides for hundreds and hundreds of years, and people have been observing these. And as geologists, we know what it looks like after a landslide happens. What do you look for? Well, you look for a big pile of rubble. This isn't rocket science now, OK? Big blocks of rock and smaller rocks that are in this big jumbled mess. And this whole area here, then, is this jumbled mess of material. That's the true landslide itself, the Bridge of the Gods landslide material. Remember now, in a bit, we're going to realize that this was originally all the way across to Oregon. It completely sealed off the, the, the gorge. But since that time, the Columbia River has reestablished itself. That's why we need the bridge to get across. OK, fine. But we're looking for evidence to convince ourselves that it really was a landslide. That's one thing. In this material, we have lakes. Lakes down in the, in the, in the middle of a river valley. That, that shouldn't be. River valleys are, are rivers that are draining. We're getting the water out of there. But we've got these lakes sitting in the middle of this area, of this middle of this map. That tells us that a landslide happened. Landslides screw up drainages. When we have precipitation on the, on the landslides, there's nowhere for the water to go. We create these sag ponds or these lakes. There's something called Table Mountain, which presides above the Bridge of the Gods landslide. Table Mountain is where the mountain broke. And so a head scarp for the landslide, a place where the actual mountain split. And you can look right into the guts of the mountain, and it's a sheer cliff with a bunch of exposed rock layers. That's there to look at. And even more, if you're still doubting that the landslide happened, OK. Upstream of the landslide are thousands of trees that are dead. They're standing, but they're dead. And those trees were killed because when we dammed the river, we formed this lake the lake completely submerged. They drowned these trees. And since we got rid of the lake, we go back to the river and we can see some of these standing dead trees. Lewis and Clark were the first guys to really describe these and put them into journals. OK, there's a lot of evidence that we had a landslide and not this rock arch. But you came to this title, the talk of the, you came to this talk. The title is The Bridge of the God's Landslide. So I'm like, you know. You already knew all that. OK, let's move on. Um, I need to draw now. I want to keep this visible. But I need to draw a little bit about this lake, because that's uh, obviously an interesting part of this discussion. Um, I did my best to email experts with not only the lake, but with fish people. I don't know anything about fish. But if we're blocking the Columbia River, and we're trying to get these salmon to do their normal thing and come up the river, uh, there's some issues there, right? So I managed to make some contact with a guy named Jerry Smith, who's a fish paleontologist, and he helped me with some ideas. And the geologist we're going to deal with is Jim O'Connor, who is really the specialist in uh, Columbia River Gorge geology. And, and his current project, one of his current projects, is to work out some details on this lake of the gods. OK, uh, gosh, you know, what am I going to do here? I'm going I'm to try to use both of these. Camera people, I hope you can kind of play along here. I want to use that one and this one. All right, so let's do this. Let's, let's screw with this map. Let's actually have the landslide. It's, the landslide just happened. OK, so we've got the landslide completely blocking the gorge. And we're going to back up this uh, river to the point where we have this lake. And again, the lake is going all the way up to Tri-Cities, 170 miles up valley. Um, I'd like to do a cross-section of the same thing. So this is a map of the, Bonneville, of the Bonneville landslide, otherwise known as the Bridge of the Gods landslide. This is a cross-section of the same thing. I better write that. This is a cross-section. Let's put a Native American up here. OK? So the, uh, before the landslide happened, we had the Columbia River flowing from east to west. Okay, Do you see what we're doing? We're looking down on the landslide here. 
we're now looking at the same landslide from the side. And this is a 300 foot tall landslide that just came down into the valley. Are we all good, we all good now? Okay. So Jim O'Connor has been doing some work to try to figure out how long would it take to fill this bathtub behind the landslide dam before it breaches the landslide, before it actually start, the water starts to spill over the top of this thing. And so O'Connor has taken the average flow velocity of the Columbia historically. He's worked with details of the morphology of the basin that we're talking about. He's a numbers guy and a fluid hydraulics guy. And so we're just going to have to take his work, and I've got to go to some notes now. So uh, he has good evidence now, Jim O'Connor does, that the lake of the gods, so let's label this. This is the bridge of the gods, B-O-T-G. This is the lake of the gods. So at maximum depth, the lake of the gods was 300 feet deep, this water behind this barrier. And O'Connor did some work to try to figure out how long does it take to fill this bathtub, essentially, behind this landslide dam. His basic answer is about six months. Based on the rate of the water and the size of the basin we need to fill, six months to raise this thing. Until, if we go six months after, we, we, don't even, we don't know when this thing happened yet, by the way, right? This could be a thousand years ago, a million years ago, last Tuesday, just kidding. So we don't know, we don't know when. But we're just working out the timing of this. Whenever this happened, it happened quickly, it dammed the river six months to fill uh, the Lake of the Gods up to 300 feet elevation. So now water's gonna start dribbling over the top of this dam, this landslide dam. Now, how are the salmon dealing with this? Probably not well. They're probably spawning still just here. They can't get any further up the river than this. And they want to get up the Yakima, they want to get up the Snake and all the rest of our beloved rivers here in eastern Washington. But uh, then it gets a little murky. Um, when does the river start working down through this dam? In other words, when, when can we start restoring this river? Before I try to get a few dates on that, the concept we want is, let me try this. Before the landslide, we can imagine the river channel, let's just for simplicity's sake, coming right down the middle of the floodplain, okay? So there's a floodplain on both sides. We've got trees growing on the floodplain. They're not in the river. They're next to the river, and it's a nice, happy, idyllic scene. Fine. Now, we bring the landslide in. Of course, we're going to stop this. We're going to have that river go away. We're going to make the Lake of the Gods. And my point here on this map is that when we finally get the Columbia to start flowing again, it's not going to be able to be in its uh, familiar course. It's going to find a way to kind of circle around the toe of the landslide. So the channel itself shifted about a, a mile to the south to, get, to navigate this Bridge of the Gods landslide. And really, it's still trying to get through the landslide. In other words, it has down quite, quite a bit. But there are still tremendous rapids that Lewis and Clark had to deal with, big rocks in the river. Those big rocks are there because the, the river's trying to get through this, this Bridge of the Gods landslide. Okay, good. So we're a little bit away from the original course of that river. Um, O'Connor's got a lot of work, but here's the couple things I want to try to uh, bring along to you. So if this is our, our high water mark of 300 feet, Lake of the Gods, O'Connor has good evidence that for a while, this could be months, could be years, maybe even more, that the lake level was lowered to 260 feet. So there was a 40-foot drop, meaning that there was some sort of breaching, a partial breach of the landslide dam to get the lake to this level. And you're like, well, how does he know that originally the lake was up here and then the lake went down to 260? Well, he's got some river deltas coming in from side channels that are at that particular elevation. And those river deltas are substantial. And so he's got a good datum here that he thinks that that lake was at this elevation for a while. So his, one of his emails to me was helping me see that this is about a five-mile distance. 
And these are rapids now. At this time, when the lake is at 260 uh, elevation, we've got uh, an incredible, hellacious set of rapids that have to rise 260 feet in a five-mile stretch. What, would, what did that look like? That the Columbia is now flowing, but it's going through a major section of the landslide dam. Uh, Jerry Smith is unsure, or maybe I didn't ask the question correctly, but can the salmon deal with that? A 260-foot climb over a five-mile span uh, back at this time. Jerry's general comments are, look, we've got salmon that are not going extinct. We've got um, uh, a million or two million years of generation of these salmon. They've dealt with hundreds of these landslides. This is not a do or die situation. We don't have salmon going extinct because of this particular event. So you maybe want more, you want actual numbers, you know, how long did it take for the river to go through? O'Connor says, we can't do that. We don't have the data yet. Maybe we'll never have the data to really figure out exactly where we had the breach, but we can say this. There was not one catastrophic breach of this landslide dam. In other words, there wasn't one event to just cut through the whole thing. From O'Connor's work, that is not true. We have instead kind of periodic or episodic breaches of this dam, probably for some freshwater floods every once in a while. What he does have, however, is one outburst flood. So instead of a gradual breaching of this dam, there was one significant outburst flood. How does he know? He's got boulders and then sand at Portland and then silt further downstream of Portland that all work in one particular time frame. And he has Mount St. Helens ash from 1480 AD sitting on top of that outburst deposit. Let me say that again. For the first time, we're actually talking about a time now. This is a date not that long ago. This isn't thousands of years ago. This isn't millions of years ago. This is 1480 AD. A Mount St. Helens ash sitting on top of an outburst flood deposit that indicates one significant breach event of the Bridge of the Gods landslide. So what can we say? We can say the landslide happened sometime before 1480, based on the fact we have an outburst event where we have parts of the dam that are now downstream. More coming on the dates, but that's our first little taste of that. Okay, you doing all right? I'm gonna keep rolling, whether you are or not. That's not very nice of me, is it? Uh, no, I'm just gonna keep that there. So let me check my notes. Right. Right. Oh, uh, the downed trees, or the drowned trees, I should say. Let's put some trees in here. So remember our trees? They are here. They got completely soaked, more than soaked. They're, they're completely underwater in this bathtub water. Can we figure out when those trees died? If we can figure out the age of death of the trees, we can get an age for the landslide. Well, there's a guy named Donald Lawrence that was in here back in the 1930s. They were about to put the Bonneville Dam in. Bonneville Dam is here. In 1938, they opened, they, they, they opened a Bonneville Dam. So before the Bonneville Dam was actually put in, uh, this guy was running around trying to survey all these trees. He visited more than 1,000 of these dead trees and cataloged them and did some tree ring analysis and tried to ultimately come up with the age of the Bonneville landslide, or the Bridge of the God landslide, same thing. So that didn't work so well. He didn't get down to an actual date, but many of those samples he collected have been radiocarbon dated more recently, and so I'll cut to the chase. From dating the trees, from dating the trees, we now can get down to Here's our best bracket for the age of the Bridge of the Gods landslide. The landslide happened quickly. It happened quickly. It didn't happen during this whole span. But using the age of the trees and the tree ring analysis and the deposit downstream, this is as close as we can get. The Bridge of the Gods landslide happened sometime during this two and a half decade span. Okay? So, 
Checklist people, there we go. We've got a date for this event. Now, can we then do one more thing on the chalkboard? Can we actually speculate on why that event happened? Uh, I've got other facts and figures here I'm just going to blow by. All right, good. So I think we need a timeline before we do anything else. So give me a chance here. I'm kind of warm in the room tonight for reasons I don't understand. Maybe it's because it's damn near spring outside. That's maybe part of it. Spring break is coming. We're done with the winter quarter. Feels great. March madness. Oh, man, what a, what a great time of the year. So let me do this if you, if you give me a chance. Just give me a chance. That's all I ask. Just give me a chance. Uh, so these are dates A.D., 1400 A.D., 1500 A.D., uh, we got too much to juggle in our minds now. I think we need some, something to keep track of these dates. Okay, let's put some things in here. So what did we just decide? We decided that the bridge of the God's landslide happened 1425 to 1450. Do you see my timeline here? Um, Lewis and Clark came through and took notes in 1805, late October of 1805. They noticed these dead trees. They noticed the landslide. They deduced there was a landslide. But looking at the trees in particular, they thought, well, in their journals, they thought, well, this thing probably happened just a couple decades before us, Lewis and Clark did. They said, well, a big landslide happened and probably happened in the late 1700s. We now know that that's not true. Okay, fine. They did great work, obviously. Um, the fellow Lawrence started looking at trees that are living on top of the Bonneville landslide, or the Bridge of the Gods landslide. And the oldest tree he was able to find dated to 1562. Which tree is that? That's the oldest living tree on top of the landslide, to help us realize that the landslide happened, had to happen before that. Fine. What else can we put on our timeline? Well, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. <laughs> the birth of the USA, 1776. We could do some other things, but we don't need to. Here's where I'm headed. You've heard that we have great earthquakes, haven't you? <laughs> Magnitude 9 earthquakes. This was not known until the 1980s. Brian Atwater figured it out. When's the last time we had a great earthquake? That's right, the year 1700. Magnitude nine, a great earthquake. You see where I'm going with this. And before I go much further, I gotta choose my words really carefully. Are you ready? There is a chance, there is a chance that there's a connection between great earthquakes, magnitude nine earthquakes that have shook the entire Pacific Northwest and big landslides like this. I am not tonight saying there is overwhelming evidence to tie those two things together. But there's a chance because of the evidence I'm about to share with you, okay? Are we clear on that? Not peddling one thing, not in love with it, but boy, you can't ignore the evidence I'm about to share with you to put that together and you're like, oh. What? You just showed us that the, the big earthquake was 1700, and you just said that we have this event that happened centuries earlier. <laughs> Hello, friends. Okay, we're getting the phone. We got the phone. Good. It's all right. We have a cycle of great earthquakes. They happen every so often. They didn't happen just once. And tonight, we're going to look at evidence for a second to most recent great earthquake. Guess when it happened? <coughs> so I got an email from a guy named David in Portland. And he sent a nice email and asked me a question. Do you think the Bridge of the Gods was triggered by a full rip, a magnitude 9 earthquake? And I e emailed back and I said, I'm sorry, David, no. We've got this date for the Bridge of the Gods and we've got this date for the Great Earthquake. So we thought that for a while, but we don't think that anymore. Sorry, thanks for the email. 
And he, David from Portland emailed right back and said, I wasn't talking about the 1700 full rep. I just saw something in the Portland newspaper, and they had data for many of the full reps, and they had specific dates for these great earthquakes. And the second to most recent full rep was 1468. Plus or minus 50. <laughs> There's always error with these events. So I'm like, wow, I'd never seen that specific date before. Is that really true? He's like, well, that's what I read. In the, they, they had a little da table and they had uh, all this stuff. So I started emailing. I mean, the first guy that I emailed was a guy named Chris Goldfinger. That's a name. And Chris Goldfinger um, is a specialist in studying deposits out in the ocean floor. And you're like, well, why is he out there? Well, when we have a great earthquake, there are underwater landslides that send deposits down slopes. And the nest or the result of those underwater landslides is something called a turbidite. A turbidite. What's a turbidite? It's an underwater landslide deposit. And Chris Goldfinger has studied at the mouth of each of these submarine canyons. These are Grand Canyon-like canyons, by the way, underwater. Hey, I told you we were just going one place. OK, I'm sorry. We're, we're out in the ocean now, just for a second, OK? So Goldfinger has been studying these turbidite deposits offshore. And he's got a 1700, the year 1700, great earthquake, turbidite, in every one of these places. So that confirms that we had this great earthquake. And the ground shook, and these underwater landslides came down all these canyons at the same time. But in most of these locations, he's got another turbidite. He calls it T2, turbidite 2. Not T1, but T2, the second to youngest full rip. And when I emailed him, I said, this guy saw this thing in the Oregonian. Where's this date coming from? He said, well, that's, that's my stuff. Those are my dates. But we actually have a better date now, a more accurate date. Instead of 1468, like it was in the newspaper, our better date with a couple of new techniques is 1456. Plus or minus 50. <laughs> and so I'm saying, wow. That's amazing. And I said, do you think there's a connection at all? And he's like, well, I don't know, but what do they have for the newest dates on the Bridge of the Gods landslide? And I said, pretty much the same thing, 1425 to 1450. So that's kind of where we are, a potential connection. And the plot thickens a little bit with the visuals I'm going to have for you in just a couple of seconds. And we're going to visit with Chris Goldfinger and Brian Atwater and Jim O'Connor and a bunch of others. So be patient for that. We'll go to the screen in just a second. Well, let's go through this whole stuff again, but real, we need the visuals. It's such a beautiful place, and we'll go through some of these same questions and add quite a bit of content, so it's not the same content over and over again. You are sitting here in beautiful Ellensburg, Washington. We want to head down to the Columbia River Gorge, don't we? It takes us three and a half hours to get to Portland through the gorge. And this is the place. My goodness sakes, there is so much to absorb as you approach uh, from the east, Mount Hood presiding on the Oregon side. Lob is on the Washington side. And this was the scene more than a century ago, same idea. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. The lava layers have nothing to do with the Cascades. We made that point quickly. There's railroads on both sides of the river. There's all sorts of transportation on both sides of the river. And when we finally get in the middle of the Columbia River Gorge, we've got our destination for tonight. The Bridge of the Gods landslide just up the river of the Bonneville Dam. So a, a map from Davy Barnwell to help us. The, on the Oregon side, the Dalles, Rowena Crest, Mosier, Hood River. Here's the Bridge of the Gods, the actual bridge. We eventually get to Portland. You know where we are. Google Maps help us. The Best Western Plus right there by the bridge. <laughs> and Best Western Plus where I stay when I go down there and the bridge, bridge side uh, restaurant right next door. And both of those places are right at the foot of this bridge. There it is. Built in 1926, they had a big crowd for the grand opening. Charles Lindbergh is showing up in his airplane, flying from Portland. He barnstorms for the crowd. He goes over the bridge. He does a 180. He comes under the bridge on the way back to Portland. Crowd goes wild. 
So we're going to go onto the bridge with this uh, person. I don't have his name, but I found this on YouTube. Thank you, my UAV vids person. Did a nice job with his drone flying underneath the Bridge of the Gods. So I found some footage also on YouTube of the construction of this bridge back in the 20s. It was a different time. There's a little boat down there for safety, in case somebody falls in. This is a, a, those are some sizzling hot rivets that they're tossing up to the guy as they're riveting the bridge together. Kind of hard to believe. This is less than 100 years ago, and this was, these were the working conditions for these guys. But they knew what they were doing, obviously, and according to the sources I were able to find, nobody fell in, nobody had a problem. Truly amazing. <laughs> the Bridge of the Gods. All right, well, the bridge still stands. Those guys did a hell of a job. It's still there, doing a nice job. And you can drive back and forth. This is that toll bridge for a dollar. And uh, you might know this bridge for other reasons. This is the place to cross the Columbia River if you're hiking from Mexico to Canada on the Pacific Crest Trail. You can walk right across the bridge. In fact, here's a gal who has put some videos of her journey on the Pacific Crest Trail on YouTube, Gillian Larson. And she's riding a horse uh, on the Pacific Crest Trail. She's down here in California in the Mojave and working her way north, trying to get eventually to Canada on this uh, Pacific Crest Trail. And here she is after going through all of California and all of Oregon, and she's dropping down to the bridge. And her mother is taking the video now in the vehicle behind her, Pacific Crest Trail emblem. And here's Gillian uh, ready to pay her dollar And the woman gives it right back. That's very nice. <laughs> okay, great. So that's the bridge, but that's not our topic, right? That's not our topic. Oh, this must be the topic. Oh, my goodness sakes. Where did I find this? In the lobby of the Best Western Plus Hotel. <laughs> right behind the front desk. <laughs> so we might as well do this, what the hell, we're at it. No evidence for a rock bridge over the Columbia. Instead, we want this. Now check it out, check this out for a second. So here's the bridge that Gillian was just crossing on her horse, four miles down river. Here's the Bonneville Dam in three places. They put the dam in there in 1938 because again, of the narrowness of the channel. Look at these lakes in the middle of the river. Everything in brown, of course, is the landslide, the Bridge of the Gods landslide that originally sealed off the valley and the river has restored itself. So shots from Tom Foster, hugefloods.com, the Bridge of the Gods, the actual bridge, the Bonneville Dam. This is all material that slid south from Washington. This is the landslide itself. You'll see it the next time you drive if you haven't noticed it before. Bonneville Dam built in this landslide complex. Bridge of the Gods, the bridge. Dotted trails, the Pacific Crest Trail. Bonneville Dam. You got it now, right? Beacon Rock is downriver. Skamania Lodge is close by on the Washington side. Chris Smart, the silver fox with his red hair. We'll talk about him in a second. Well, I guess we can talk about him now. We filmed a video program, a little five-minute TV program, on this Bridge of the Gods landslide. And we needed permission, so a ranger is supervising our filming. Uh, at Bonneville Dam, and let's move on. Now, I'm 55 years old, and I'm not kidding you that it dawned on me just a few months ago what AKA actually stands for. <laughs> I had no idea. Also known as, wow, okay, great. Well, the light bulb went off. Bridge of the Gods, Bonneville Landslide, same thing. I'm using them interchangeably tonight, and they should be used interchangeably. More shots, aerial shots of the Bonneville Landslide, Bridge of the Gods Landslide. Can you see it now? If, I don't know if you were doubting at all, but hopefully it should be super obvious to you now. More imagery for you. Here's the bridge, bridge. 
Here's our landslide that broke free from Table Mountain. So before we look carefully at the landslide itself, let's remind ourselves that these major lava flows, these are beautiful photos from hugefloods.com, these huge lava flows are coming from the east. They're coming from the east. Here's Advantage Washington and these monster lava flows. So again, beautiful photograph, Mount Hood, basalt, no connection between the two, zero. Instead, those basalt flows are the flood basalts of eastern Washington that predate everything in this lecture. We're back 15 million years ago now. And here's a couple quick maps to show you how much of the Pacific Northwest was buried in basalt lava. And where did that lava come from? It came from these cracks. Again, our topic tonight is right in here. So again, there's a regional story with the rock layers that you see exposed. And in fact, the rock layers that are failing to create the Bridge of the Gods landslide. So this is the scene in eastern Washington 15 million years ago when those lavas were coming to the surface. And today, if we zoom in and look carefully, there's specific events. This is a lava flow that came out 15.4 million years ago and flowed through the Cascades, the Cascades that were lower at that time. And notice there's a finger of this lava flow that crosses over the mountains and gets to Yaquina Head. And another finger of this follows the Columbia the whole way. So there's debate for, from, for some that the, perhaps there was quite a bit of crossing of the Columbia of Basalt lavas and the Cascades. And the Cascades have uplifted quite a bit since. More coming on that in just a second. This is Rowena Dell. Man, it's a great time of the year to be down there this spring. I hope you go down and enjoy it. This is what I did in the chalkboard. This is from Marley Miller's Roadside Geology Book of Oregon, Washington on the right, South uh, Oregon, and our dipping beds. Our dipping beds ripe for slope failure. And so the waterfalls are on the Oregon side because of what we talked about. And see those, you maybe notice these tilted beds as you drive up and down the gorge. Why are those beds tilted? I'm saying they're tilted, but can we investigate briefly why they're tilted? So the original flat laying basalt layers were squeezed and compressed and warped. And those warps are not only in the gorge, but they're all the way up here to Yakima and Ellensburg. Here's a little short video clip to help us see that. The river was here first. And this land has been lifting against the river. We know the river is older, because of its curvy nature. Meanders only form when an area is flat. So you got it? The river was here first when the air was flat. Then this land started to lift and these ridges started to grow. Why? The canyon is a direct result. Okay, so I'm, I'm uh, much longer after the chalkboard session, I'm finally answering that first question I had for you. How is it possible for the Columbia River to cut through the Cascades? The answer is the river's been there a lot longer than the Cascades have. It's not that we had a powerful river, it's that the river has an old age and the uplift of the Cascades as well as these local ridges is the response. Here's a good shot of that. The Columbia River at the Dalles hangs a right, goes right through a major ridge, the Columbia Hills. And that's because the Columbia Hills anticline is younger than the river itself. More shots showing the same thing from Marley Miller. So, familiar scene to all of us. The scenery is great, but maybe some new ideas for you. So those tilted layers are related to the Yakima folds, is my point. The, the ridges we have south of Ellensburg are also the re reason that these ridges and these beds are tilting so much. Now, again, why are we getting the tilting? There's a GPS network uh, operated by the guys in my department up on the third floor. They're very bright people. And they have these instruments across the Northwest that are communicating with our building on the top floor of uh, the New Science 2 building. It's called the Panga Network. And these instruments are helping us understand tiny movements in the crust. Tiny movements in the crust. And those, that data comes in every half a second from all those stations to the third floor of Science 2. And if you have every one of those red dots be one of these little stations, there's an interesting thing to point out. Here's a little thumbnail sketch of every one of those instruments in this network. So we have hardworking people in our department who monitor and maintain those instruments. Here are the vectors showing the motion of every one of those stations. 
And can you see, can you see that California, Oregon, and Washington are doing a graceful clockwise rotation? That's the answer for why these beds are tilted. They're tilted because northern Washington and Canada is not rotating, but everybody else is. And so we're squeezing the layers and tilting them as a result. So if it wasn't for these clockwise rotation uh, diagrams, we wouldn't have the Bonneville landslide. We wouldn't have the Bridge of the Gods landslide. We need those tilted beds to do that. And the tilting is coming from this tectonic story. I also didn't mention in the chalkboard discussion that there is an impact of these things called the Ice Age floods. Most of you know the general story. Here's something in case you don't. This is the last two million years of time. Uh, ice water is coming from the Pacific Northwest, crossing the Pacific Northwest, getting into the Columbia River Gorge, and eventually coming all the way down to the Pacific Ocean. Um, here's a place in eastern Washington called Dry Falls, and this is one of our simulations to show you how dramatic those floods were. And one question is, well, what happened to the water? Where did it go? It all came down the Columbia River Gorge. It all came right through our, stopic, our topic uh, tonight, our, our, our study site. Uh, so there is an Ice Age floods impact, but we don't want to be too carried away with the Ice Age floods. The Ice Age floods did not create the Columbia River Gorge. The Ice Age floods did not do tremendous amounts of erosion in the Columbia River Gorge. It cleaned it up. It took some of those landslides out of there. This is long before the Bridge of the Gods, by the way. But I'm just pointing out that when you drive the Columbia River Gorge, you can see the bottom two thirds of the walls are heavily scoured and you can see the basalt rock layers. But the upper third, you can't see them. That's because the flood, the Missoula floods were not that high. Bottom part scoured, upper part of the gorge not scoured by water. This is Beacon Rock, downstream of Bridge of the Gods, totally underwater during the major Ice Age flood events. This is the Vista House looking east. Here's Beacon Rock and the Bridge of the Gods is in the, back, the distance. During the biggest Ice Age floods, the flood water was almost up to the parking lot of the Vista House. But again, not a major player in forming the gorge and certainly not a player in our landslide topic tonight. Salilo Falls is upstream of the Bridge of the Gods landslide and it was an Ice Age floods feature. Those rapids were not the result of a landslide, but result of Ice Age floods digging and scouring and, and excavating rock. And this is uh, upriver up of the Dalles. Uh, so where we had Celilo Falls, we now have quiet water behind one of the dams. So let's get into the juicy part and talk about the details. Here's the old shoreline of the Lake of the Gods in blue behind the Bonneville landslide, which completely sealed off the gorge. Can we see where the mountain split? We sure can. The head scarp of Table Mountain helps us do that. Let's have this guy help us out. That's Table Mountain right there. You can see where that mountain split, broke and slid down to dam the Columbia River. The Bridge of the Gods. This is Cascade Locks, Oregon, at the heart of the gorge, where the river passes through the center of the Cascade Mountains. Majestic waterfalls plunge down the steep walls of the Oregon side of the river, with the historic Columbia River Highway winding its way through dense forests. The river is choked down here. It's nowhere near this narrow anywhere else in the gorge. Why? Good question. We know the answer. And instead of just Table Mountain breaking free, there are other head scarps with other landslides with other dates. So the point is, our landslide tonight is one of many landslides that have happened on the Washington side of the river. Presumably, many of those landslides the salmon had to deal with as well. Lewis and Clark, 1805. As Lewis and Clark approached this part of the gorge in 1805, Clark noted thousands of fresh looking, partially submerged trees in the Columbia River. A submerged forest with trees up to 25 feet tall. And Lewis and Clark were about to encounter a set of rocky rapids. The Great Chute, they called it. 
The Cascades of the Columbia, represented here by artist Charles Fritz. Swift, perilous rapids navigated by the Corps of Discovery in wooden boats. But where did this rocky pinch point in the river come from? Okay, so old photographs, after Lewis and Clark, of course, in 1805, but before the dams were put in, in 1930s and 40s. Here's the old rapids that the Lewis and Clark had to deal with, even as recently as 1932. It was a serious place, and it was a serious place because of those big blocks, those big boulders that are part of the Bridge of the Gods landslide. So you can see what I mean. The Columbia River has not completed its job of completely getting through all the rest of that landslide material. But obviously it's restored itself, and the salmon are grateful for that. Back in the 1840s, the first uh, visual confirmation that those dead trees were there in the middle of the river, upstream of the Bonneville Dam, the Bonneville landslide. So these were a curiosity for many years, and then geologists started studying them very carefully and trying to work with the specific story. Most thought a landslide was responsible. Not everybody did. And this is Don Lawrence, the guy who spent many summers in the 30s before the dams were put in to categorize, catalog, and study, and sample thousand, more than 1,000 of these pine trees and other kinds of trees that were killed. Why are these trees dead? They were completely under the, the Lake of the Gods, remember? When you do find a, a buried tree with the bark on it, and if the tree has a lot of annual growth rings in it, well, that is an opportunity to use a, a good technique called wiggle match radiocarbon dating with this wiggling decay curve from radiocarbon. And the computer software helps you match it up to the best possible fit. And that really allows you to get within a decade or two uh, of the actual date of the event, the actual calendar date sometimes. So that's Pat, Pat Pringle, the fellow who's been able to get our radiocarbon years down to that window that we had, along with the work of Jim O'Connor. So we're back to Chris Smart from Central, coming down last summer and visiting with uh, the main geologist that we're profiling tonight, Jim O'Connor, Portland-based USGS geologist, hell of a nice guy, and spent the morning with us right there by the Best Western. Chris getting his camera set up, and we got Jim on camera talking about his work with the Lake of the Gods and the breaching of the landslide. Geologist Jim O'Connor and colleagues continue to zero in on the exact date of the Bonneville landslide, the Bridge of the Gods. We're still working out the whole sequence of events here, but from what we know or think we know so far is that this landslide occurred sometime between 1425 and 1450 AD. Um, a lake formed behind the landslide dam. The, the, the landslide completely blocked the Columbia River. The lake was maybe close to 300 feet deep. It spilled over, but at some point it breached the landslide dam and it breached catastrophically, sending a huge flood down the Columbia all the way to the Pacific and recently discovered sediment on the sea floor suggests there may have been a large earthquake in the mid-1400s. Could that have been the trigger for the Bridge of the Gods landslide? Today, the rapids, as well as most of the Cascades locks and canal are underwater, drowned in 1938 by the reservoir behind Bonneville Dam. The Bridge of the Gods was here almost 600 years ago, but how many more landslides were here in the last couple of million years? And when will the next big landslide happen? Fine work by Chris Smart from Central Washington University. Okay, we're finishing up with our discussion of a potential, a potential, a potential connection between seismic activity and this big landslide. Lewis and Clark thought the landslide happened a couple decades before their journey. O'Connor and Pringle now have the date between 1425 and 1450. If we go offshore, we go to the submarine canyons and we realize we have these history of great earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest, we can owe it all to this fellow here, Brian Atwater, who put this story together. He's the guy that documented that we had a great earthquake on the night of January 26, 1700 at 9 o'clock local time. 
And if you're not sure how he came up with that, we've had a lecture on that before. Check it out. So here's that water in every one of these yellow circles finding evidence for great earthquakes, not just in 1700, but before that. Here's the tectonic model that we have, the plate tectonic model that we have for these great earthquakes. We subduct the ocean plate. Every few hundred years, we build up enough energy along the boundary between the subducting plate and the overriding plate to finally fail the boundary, release the energy, displace the water, create terrifying tsunami, and shake the ground like hell. Rinse and repeat, I'm afraid. So here's another um, animation showing the same thing. Sorry, let's go back. Here's another animation showing the same thing. We're subducting the Juan de Fuca plate all along the coastline from Vancouver Island down to Northern California. And this is the 1700 event where the entire margin ruptures. So it's a Pacific Northwest story. And we're not saying tonight that that event in 1700 has anything to do with the Bridge of the Gods landslide. Why? Because the dates are wrong, right? But what we are saying is that there's a potential story with the second to most recent great earthquake. Here's that water and how we find some of the coastal. So Brian is a famous geologist, and he's famous because of that work, among other things. But he's the specialist on the coast, on the Washington and Oregon coast. He knows how to read this mud and how to find these uh, horizons that tell us of great earthquakes. So here's the 1700. Now, this is Brian Atwater at the coast, right? So he doesn't have anything from 1425 to 1450. So let's slow our roll here just a second. Goldfinger's the guy that's got the turbidite, that's coming. But on the coast here, there is no evidence of a great earthquake from our time of the Bridge of the Gods landslide. So maybe we need to pause. But we do have one, two, three, four, five significant events. And if you're trying to picture what one of these earthquakes was like, I'm afraid we've had a couple of them in the last decade and a half. And if you're old enough to remember Alaska and Chile back in the 60s, those were all great earthquakes all great earthquakes. And every time you have a great earthquake, you're in a subduction zone that's unlocking its energy. This is the one that happened the day after Christmas 2004. And we send a tsunami across the Indian Ocean. We all remember uh, Tohoku in Japan uh, more recently. Look at the death toll here from that earthquake and tsunami. I mean, wow. This is Chris Goldfinger, the guy we've been talking about. He happened to be in Japan during this 2011 great earthquake. So he's being interviewed by NOVA to describe the tsunami experience. Once the wave starts to pick up uh, part of a town, the, the warehouses along the dock, the debris and all that, then it becomes more like a glacier. You know, it's a, it's a moving wall of debris. And the more mass it has, the more power it has as it comes in. It doesn't really look like water beyond some point. It looks like the entire town is flowing in, and, and it is. So all the mass of all the buildings, cars, refrigerators, and everything that's in that wall, it's essentially a debris glacier at that point, and it just keeps coming in. Okay, we don't need any more of that. So it seems like we're on a tangent, but we're not. Remember what we're doing. We're trying to talk about a potential trigger for the Bridge of the Gods landslide, and we're almost there with Chris Goldfinger's turbidite. So let's get to these emails. So I, I mentioned to you last fall, I get an email from David in Portland. I've never met him, amateur guy, happened to find one of my videos on YouTube and said, do I think the Bridge of the Gods landslide was triggered by the six, 1468 AD great earthquake? And again, my first thought is I looked up this and I'm like, well, there isn't one uh, that from Atwater's evidence. This is what David saw in the Portland newspaper a plot of the last 10,000 years of time. Here are the earthquakes along the Pacific Northwest coast of magnitude nine, a full rip, eight and a half, eight, magnitude seven, et cetera. And David's eye was drawn to what we're talking about, the second most recent full rip. In other words, the entire length of the Cascadia subduction zone releases energy. Estimated at 8.7 instead of nine for magnitude. And that article also had a little plot of all of the years and the length of the ruptures and whether it was a partial or a full rip offshore. 
So that prompted me to go, okay, I guess this is really something. This is from Sandy Doughton's books, and there have been 20 of these full rip 9.0s in the last 10,000 years, and another 20 partial, according to the evidence that Chris Goldfinger has. Let me remind you now and add some visuals. Here we are offshore. We have a big earthquake, presumably. We shake the ground dramatically. We send an underwater landslide called a turbidity current down the channel, and that underwater landslide finally comes to rest. This is a landslide through water, not a landslide through air. So we are gonna get some sorting. This is a graded bed, as opposed to the Bridge of the Gods landslide, which is just a jumbled, poorly sorted mess. So I emailed Chris. In fact, I emailed him on a Saturday morning at breakfast time, sent the email, went out and mowed the lawn, got back, there's a full email from Chris Goldfinger, Saturday morning, this guy's working all the time. So he had a full email and basically said, yeah, that table's my stuff, compiled somebody else. We've got a better date, 1456 plus or minus 50, and our turbidite two is clearly present along the full length of Cascadia in dozens of cores, it exists. Well, then I couldn't hold it. I, got to, I had to email Brian Atwater, the guy from the coast. And I said, here's what I'm hearing about this T2. What do you think? Remember now, this is Atwater from the coast. Atwater had a completely different explanation or possible interpretation for that thing we're calling T2. Brian says, how about that's a deposit offshore that's from breaching the landslide. Remember, we had that deposit coming down the Columbia River that O'Connor had with the Mount St. Helens ash on top of it. Maybe you flush a bunch of that sediment out offshore, and maybe that's a, a, a current, a, a, a high density current that's flowing at the base of the ocean, and maybe instead of a great earthquake for T2, maybe it's the actual breaching of the landslide. Emailed O'Connor, I was on a roll. This is all on Saturday, by the way. All these guys are working on Saturday. It's impressive. Uh, and O'Connor says he can't really comment on the T2 turbidite thing, but he does have that partial failure of the landslide dam, and we can follow that all the way down to the lower estuary of the Columbia. I went back to Goldfinger one more time. Uh, I suppose we're beyond Saturday by now. He says, man, we got this T2 at most of these underwater canyons. We've even got the T2 in a basin that isn't connected to the uh, uh, sediment coming from uh, North America. And um, so he's still wondering if there's, a, there's an earthquake connection. So to review, from the work of Pringle and O'Connor, we've got the landslide between 1425 and 1450. Do we have a for sure trigger for that landslide? We do not, but We've got a sediment layer for sure from the age that matches with this Bridge of the God landslide. There's a difference of opinion currently, at least by email, on how to interpret that sediment horizon. So that's the Bridge of the Gods. We've answered our questions, tilted beds for sure. The conventional answer was just a wet series of years and we just had a landslide because things were soaked. We can add the quake story if we're feeling gutsy. Roadside Geology of Oregon is a wonderful new book by Marley Miller. She's got a, also a brand new book called Roadside Geology of Washington. I encourage you to check those out. If you're interested in the huge flood story, hugefloods.com by Tom Foster in Pasco is an excellent resource for free. And before we quit, since this is the last of our four winter lectures, I want to just point out that I want to thank the university that I work for for uh, encouraging these kinds of outreach efforts and this, you paid for this brand new building that we have on the campus of Central Washington University. I wanna remind you that I opened my class to the public, so we always have some folks coming in and sitting in with these college kids. And a special shout out to Bob and Tony who work the grounds at the campus. I said, hey, if you guys ever find any more of these old chalkboards, I want some. <laughs> and they found these two in the basement of Shaw Smizer building a few years ago. And those are the, built, the chalkboards I've been using the last couple of lectures. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.